uh, Henry and, and Max for the invitation, and I have warm memories of a small room at Columbia where Dixon and Henry uh, started this kind of a conversation. So congratulations, you've come, come quite a way. <laughs> So um, I'm very pleased to be here um, uh, the, okay, uh, and talk to you about sort of a deeper dive into things. So you saw a much bigger picture from Oscar. Um, we are producing a, a facility that will grow a million and a half pounds a year of leafy greens. And in order to do that, you really have to understand the systems that are involved. So I'm going to share a few ideas, not that we've come up with all the answers, but I would like to share with you some thoughts about it. So if uh, water is a very important aspect of uh, sort of the, I, I think of it as the resilience that you have to create in a system uh, that grows leafy greens, you need some way to conserve the water as much as, as possible. I know that from putting an installation in, in Jeddah, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, where all the water comes from a reverse osmosis system. So um, if you think about this, there's uh, start with the water and seeds uh, in the upper right-hand corner and move down through nutrients, transpiration, and evaporation, and then you end up with your product and you're left with roots, culls, and stems. And if this somewhat represents your system, you'll note that every single one of those steps has some water involved in it. Now what I, okay, there's a little piece of this missing, but that circle that I just added uh, to the transpiration and evaporation is what I was speaking about. We need to recover that water and it's not that difficult to do. It is somewhat energy intensive, but if you're in an area where water is a real concern, then we need to have some method to capture that transpired and evaporated water and put it back into the system so that we have really a totally closed loop relative to um, water. So what are some of the additional things? And Oscar brought up a few of these. There's gray water from the sinks and the product wash and the rainwater. And I'm only now just talking about the, the, the plant factory itself. Um, and then you have to consider what this water source is and what it means to the growing of plants. It has to be disease free. It has to not have toxic metals in it. And unfortunately, we've contaminated a great deal of our water sources and our effluent tends to come with an awful lot of things that we don't want. And if it's a real hot water, it's not going to do very well with the plant, so we have to have some way to cool it. Now, I put this up here, and with all due respect to Oscar, um, I used reverse osmosis water, and although the technology has become more efficient, you end up throwing away a great deal of water in the process of doing this. And I've learned that when you do battle with nature, you lose. So you have to figure out how to use the water that's coming to you and make the best of it and grow plants without doing a lot of energy intensive and potentially water wasting um, uh, in the process. So let's also then look at nutrient uh, recycling. Here I have the same set of boxes, and this time it has water and humidity uh, there in, the, in, the, um, in that, uh, cy that cycle there, that circular uh, aspect for water. But now let's ask ourselves, is there something else that we need to conserve in terms of resources, and that would be nutrients? And where would we do that? We would do that by taking the roots and the culls and the, st and the stems and capturing the nutrients that we would otherwise do something else with and put them back into the system. I'm not going to tell you that I figured out exactly how to do this. But at the moment, there are plenty of other alternatives that are, are, that are responsible ways to do it. But it would be ideal for us, just like with the water system, to capture it and put it back into the system, back into the cycle do the same thing with, with the nutrients. So some of the alternatives that have uh, been explored are composting, vermicomposting, which is somewhat different, animal feed, 
um, there's animal feed in the wet sense, the immediate sense, but there's also ways to convert that, that waste into uh, animal feed. Um, doggy biscuits is one thing that comes to mind that someone is, is doing with, with the waste. And then there are many other uh, value added. At the current time, we're using vermicomposting. What's nice about this in the sense of the circular economy is it has set up another business for a couple of individuals. They then create an added value product from our waste stream, and that added value product is, is the worms that they produce and the worm castings, and so they eventually, that all eventually goes back into the uh, circular uh, setup. Lighting is the most critical uh, decision one can make, and just recently, I started hearing this term out in the scientific community of phenotypic plasticity. Uh, two big words, but um, basically what it means is can you take the same genetics, the same seed, uh, plant a bunch of different plants, and can you get different results from those same genetics? And I think one of the things that I am beginning to understand from the plant side of things is that plants have a lot more going on than just the genetics. It's the environment and it's a number of other aspects that are kind of in between. Um, so the phenotypic plasticity can be, the outcome of it can be um, an impact on the organoleptic properties. And that's another $25 word, but I like organoleptic uh, as a term. It represents the taste, the vision, the, the hearing, actually the crunch that comes along with it, which is very important to all of, of the consumers, uh, and the smell. So it's our senses uh, is what that rep represents. So some of it comes out that way. Um, it needs to be balanced with the window of available genetics. So when you're doing this, you're still somewhat confined by the genetics that you got originally. So I tend to think of things in a simple sense. I have genetics, it gives me a window. I can play the game anywhere within that window that, that I can uh, create stimuli to the, the uh, phytochemicals within the plant to create some kind of an organoleptic output. If I move that genetic window to another place, then I can get a different outcome. You can think of that on a species basis or even just on a particular cultivar basis. Okay, um, and then we need to understand the intersections uh, with other variables. So many of the variables in the environment are really what gives us this phenotypic plasticity. So looking at that entire matrix, and it's an incredible matrix, that's why I think for many, many, many years to come, we will be looking at the science behind how we grow our plants, get the organoleptic properties that we're looking for, and essentially how do we improve on those things to benefit us? How do we manage the plants to get there? Um, another aspect of this then is uh, the energy use, and um, it's it's been amazing uh, how much improvement has occurred. And I think all of us in vertical farming that depend totally on electric light have now some appreciation for and and definitely recognize how much that's benefited us. When we first started this out, we got very little light for an awful lot of power, and that's almost flipped now, and it's become much more efficient. A lot more work is going on in that. We have a lot more to learn there as well. Um, but one of the things I don't hear talked about is the LM70, which means that you get uh, a tube or a bulb or, or some uh, LED source, uh, you have a certain amount of light that you're getting for the energy that you put in, and then it attenuates or it loses that light for the same amount of energy that you're putting in till it gets to a 70 and 70% 70 of what it was originally. That's a number that's, that is being published, the LM70, for, for um, many diodes, but what does that mean to us? I'm going to get 30% less product because the plants are directly um, uh, respondent to that. It may not matter to us in these lights here. If we lose 30% of the lights, probably we're not going to notice it. We'll accept it. We will. The plants are dependent upon every single one of those photons to, to help us out. How are we going to deal with that? Do we increase the power? Do we anticipate that in our business model? That, that's just a question that needs to be looked at. 
the efficiencies right now are uh, currently around 130 lumens per watt, and that's not the term that we use, but it's the one that you typically end up discussing with the people who sell luminaires. Um, it'll soon be at 150, and we expect that at least w we can anticipate that it will get to about 170. The last consideration in this, in terms of trying to save energy, is um, how the luminaire is put together, because it's not just about the diode efficiency, it's also about how the luminaire is put together, what it has as a driver, and, um, and how it's uh, implemented. And also, how do we manage that light relative to the stage of growth in the plants? So all of these things are, are things that are somewhat dynamic. They're dependent upon what you're, what you're growing, uh, what your intended outcome is. I would also point out that I'm on a few committees um, in which I'm, I, I'm learning a great deal about uh, uh, light and the, the terminology that goes along with it. But one of the rather interesting things is, is that there's a, there was a curve, par curve, 400 to 700 nanometers of light. It kind of went like this. Uh, and that's all being questioned now because the tools that we have and the number of repetitions that we can do to, to solidify that light uh, graph have changed and we're able to improve it considerably. Um, I also just quickly want to point out there's a few unseen things and this will be part of a theme, but here's, here's a map of places where the SO2 emissions are missing and you can see the percent that's missing and the locations that that's happening. And I saw this in an article and I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's terrible because soxes, noxes, and ethylene are not good for most plants that you're trying to grow. So if these are areas and we want to expand vertical farming to the rest of the world, we need to start being concerned about what the environment uh, has. So ethylene is, is probably the, the, um, uh, the product of imperfect combustion that's of most concern. Um, the NOx and SOx that, that are part of, of this and um, also odors that we might be producing that end up in our, in our food stuff. So something to think about when you're locating a plant, we have a way to measure the NOx and SOx and ethylene and to make sure that in our urban environment where those levels are higher, that, that, that there's something that we understand. Again, one of those things that we're doing to our environment that's not too cool. So the last topic I want to talk about is something that I think the circular economy isn't necessarily taking into consideration. So this is going to seem a little weird to plug into this kind of a, of a presentation. But look at this graph. It uh, comes from the World Obesity F uh, Federation, and they're looking at what's happening as a result of our diet, what's happening to, to the people of, of the, the world. And here you have um, the obesity prevalence worldwide uh, among women and among men, and it's not the same. And I think there's some interesting questions which I'll get to relative to that. Here's sort of an age. Boys are more obese than men, but then there's a couple of exceptions to that. Australia, China, and India. Not sure what these dynamics really are telling us. Same kind of thing for women versus girls, except China, India, and Canada. So what might be the interpretation of this? What's the cause? Who works physically hard and therefore may not uh, suffer from obesity? Who's privileged and who's not? Who can basically afford to get fat? Um, would a low-calorie, nutritious food be good? Most of us are in the business of growing baby leafy greens. They're a low-calorie, highly nutritious uh, product. Would that be better added to their diet? So therefore, would we make a nice contribution uh, to, to our world? What is the cost to the circular economy of obesity? There are medical costs, diabetes, joint replacement, etc. a whole lot of debilitating things that need to, it's sort of like money that evaporates, it's not really part of it, it's not, not, a, not, a, not a resource. Lost work, lost spending money, and then a lot of food waste. 
So what can vertical farming do about this? It can involve people in growing. And one of the things that I've noticed in the last 12 years when I've been working on this uh, vertical farming kind of approach to things is that you involve people in the growing to get much more interested in leafy greens. You won't convert everyone to uh, a more vegetarian-based diet, but you can make quite an impact. And the younger they are, the greater the impact that can be made in terms of having a healthy diet. You can attract people to better food essentially. So um, I think that's one of the things we can do. It looks more beautiful. It it's, it's, tends to be more tasty if, it, if it's done properly. We have more control, so sh we should always be growing it. And we make better food for people. So those are three things that we can do relative to that. So I plugged in health and circular economy, and I got some rather interesting results, as you always do when you plug stuff into the internet. And here's one, I'm going to read it very quickly. The circular economy is the concept of keeping resources in use for as long as possible through their recovery and reuse. I think that's missing part of what we're talking about today. But, um, and proponents believe applying these principles to health care could help ease the pressure on the sector by saving money and serving patients better. And basically what they're saying here is, is figure out how to get rid of your uh, old CT scanner and get yourself a new CT scanner. So what I would actually like this to have said, so I'm going to put some words in Hannah Gold's mouth, I would like to put in people. And I'd like you to think about people are part of one of the resources that we need to conserve, we need to have built into uh, the circular economy, and it needs to be a prominent part of that. So with that thought, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity, and I look forward to the rest of the conference.